This is the BBC. This podcast is supported by advertising outside the UK. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Morning, I'm John Pienaar. Welcome to Pienaar's Politics this Remembrance Day. What will you be thinking when silence falls in an hour's time? About those who died? About the lessons that have been learned or not learned from sacrifice? Cabinet Minister Andrea Leadsom's on Pienaar's politics, and I'll ask her. And about plans for Britain's place in tomorrow's Europe. Though just now, you name the plan and it seems to be going nowhere. Can such a prominent Brexiteer see a way through? Any way? Can she see herself staying in Theresa May's cabinet much longer? And given all that's at stake, does it matter? Seriously, it's come to that. Shadow Defence Secretary Nia Griffith is on too. Is Labour talking sense about Europe? Is Labour talking sense about defence? I'm sure she'll tell us sensibly. Also on the show, the Tory MP and Army combat veteran Johnny Mercer, who's been scathing about, well, everything. I'm John Pienaar. Thanks for clicking on the Pienaar's Politics podcast for another week. Of course, we record this on Remembrance Sunday, and that is reflected in our in our discussions. We hear the thoughts of some of our, our guests on Remembrance Sunday, what will be in their minds on a day like this, but also go beyond, as you probably would expect, to the future and the strategic position of Britain in the world and in Europe. On a day like this, that is a relevant and apposite conversation. I guess it is any day. However, have a listen. Make up your own mind. Here it is. And with us through the show this morning, Sam Coates is back, the Deputy Political Editor at The Times. Hi, Sam. Good morning. And Joe Tanner, political strategist and advisor and commentator and all sorts of other things. Joe, lovely to see you back here too. Guys, this Sunday, just after 10, what's on your mind, Sam? So Ollie Robbins is uh, back in Brussels today. Talks continue uh, to try and solve some of the thorniest issues, mechanisms, fishing, all of the stuff that's in the Sunday papers. But, 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 it feels like in the last few days, something has changed. It started with that leak of the DUP letter. From uh, from Theresa May outlining some of the compromises and problems that resist, but then you had Joe Johnson. And to be honest, looking at the Sunday papers, things haven't really moved on since four o'clock on Friday. Mm. Joe Johnson resigned as Transport Minister. Why does that matter? Because though for months we've had Brexiteers making the argument against Theresa May's plan, now you have an articulate condemnation, uh, denunciation of Theresa May's plan from a Remain point of view. Mm. And I just wonder whether lots of Remain backing Conservative MPs read that and felt a little butterfly in their stomach and wondered whether or not they ought to do the same. Mm, A sense of pressure building, as if pressure could get much stronger than it was already. Joe, what about you? Um, Well, you kind of hit upon it at the top of the show, the the idea of, you know, lessons learnt or not learnt as we come together for Remembrance Sunday. And I can't help but think that while everyone's standing together to remember those that fell for our freedoms we uh we probably are never we're probably the most divided we've ever been which is just remarkable and as sam says i mean what comes next it it doesn't appear we've got a bunch of people all claiming to be looking for solutions and working together but the reality is it, it is an absolute mess yeah, yeah. We've got a, a guest on the show a little later on. He uses a, uses a much stronger word than, than mess. I, don't know what I had to be a bit careful to be a bit fair, John. I'm, I'm certainly in Westminster. It's being described in very different terms. Yeah, that's Johnny Mercer, of course, the Conservative uh, Member of Parliament. So that's what, that's what you guys are thinking. A, a little earlier on, just ahead of the show, I asked the Leader of the House of Commons, Andrea Leadsom, of course, very prominent Brexiteer in the Cabinet, what she would be thinking. And first of all, what she would be thinking this morning, this Remembrance Day, when the silence falls at the end of the hour? Well, I'll obviously be reflecting on the extraordinary sacrifice of so many people in the Great War, um, but also on the tragedy that that wasn't the war to end all wars, as was thought at the time, and thinking about, you know, the need for government always to be so careful and so strategic about the sorts of... uh, of problems that we encounter and how we can resolve them without that horrific loss of life. Yeah, and, and this is Peanuts Politics. We talk politics on this show. I'll, I'll, I'll take my cue from you there and move on to the strategic question of the moment, which is which is Brexit, our place in Europe and the in the world. Just to be clear at the very beginning, can you 
say now, Andrea, that the Prime Minister will have your support for the deal she's trying pretty hard to strike with Brussels? Well, I will be very frank and say the Prime Minister has my absolute support in fulfilling the will of the people at the referendum, so getting us out of the EU as promised. Now I, um, as do the 17.4 million people who voted to leave the EU, have um, certain requirements of leaving the EU, which of course means that we can't be kept forever in a customs arrangement and that we don't break up our United Kingdom. And the Prime Minister has been very clear that neither of those things will happen. And that is a clear answer. You are saying, pretty unambiguously, that you, as a politician of principle, as well as a supporter of leaving the European Union, you have your red lines lines when it comes to this negotiation. There are compromises you wouldn't be able to support. Well... I'm 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 quite clear. I, I am determined that we leave the EU and I am working as hard as I possibly can to support the Prime Minister in delivering exactly that. Mm. And I know absolutely with every bit of certainty that that is her intention. We will be leaving the EU on March the 29th next year and we will be seeking the best possible deal for the United Kingdom and for the European Union. And that's what the Prime Minister is focused on and I, I she has my full support in that. But, and you will be judging the deal, if there is a deal, on its merits. Of course. As a supporter of the Leave campaign, as a supporter of Brexit. And if it doesn't meet your criteria, you will simply, you're telling me very honestly, will not be able to support it, which also means, doesn't it, you could not continue to be a member of the government. Well, I think the key thing here is, as a member of the Cabinet, as a member of the government, as somebody who has the responsibility for getting the legislation through the House, and as somebody who sits on the Cabinet Committee that's looking at day one readiness, I'm more than just a spectator. I'm actually sort of working on trying to make sure that we will get a deal that will enable those people who honour the referendum Mm. to be able to support it. That means using your influence in the Cabinet to to mould the deal into the kind of shape you can support as a... To to support, yes, indeed. To support a deal that does deliver on the will of the people. And that is what the Prime Minister is committed to delivering. And she has my full support in that. And as a politician of conviction, because on this you clearly are one, you do not balk at the idea of leaving the government if you're unable to, to cross your... Uh, all of your your, your, your T's and, and tick all your boxes in the way you want to. You see, the way I see it, I'm a, I'm a pragmatic politician. I am absolutely determined that we leave the EU. And so the issue of what I might or might not do doesn't come up because I'm determined that we get a deal that does deliver on the will of the people. And that's what I'm working towards. So I'm not kind of playing games with what I might or might not do. Mm. I, I personally think that that's the wrong approach for a politician. I think you have to be in the game. You have to be working hard to get the result you want to see. And you have to be supporting the government. And that's what I'm doing. OK, let's talk a bit about the general principle, but also about... The detail, because so much hangs on the principle. You're hoping, like many others on your side, for a comprehensive trade deal to be thrashed out by the end of 2020. That is fantastically ambitious, but that's what you hope hope to achieve. But there has to be a backstop, a fallback, in case that, that deadline is not met. And it's acknowledged now that could involve staying in the customs territory of the European Union temporarily. So from your point of view, Andrea, must Britain then be free to leave as and when it chooses without the agreement of the EU, if it comes to that? Yes, I think um, what what we've been very clear about is that we will target finalising the future trading relationship by the end of 2020. And that's what we expect to happen. And you say that would be extremely ambitious. Actually, not really, because the UK and the EU have entirely um, the same rules and regulations at the moment as a result of the UK being in the EU. So what we're talking about is not a third country which has had sort of sure. hundreds of years... No, you believe it can be achieved. Regulations. I believe it can be and will be achieved. But there needs to be a so, back a backstop exactly. plan. So the backstop is merely a backstop. It's not a sort of likely scenario. But you're absolutely right. The backstop does need to say that in order to prevent a hard border in Northern Ireland, something that is quite clear that we all want to avoid, then there would be the need for a customs arrangement that would include the entire United Kingdom whilst we finalise that future trading relationship. And yes, that must be time limited. And there can be no question of needing the approval or say-so of the European Union 
at the time of leaving that arrangement the for U- you? Yeah, the, the UK cannot be forced to remain in a customs arrangement. Now, how that specifically works is, as you will know, John, is exactly what is being discussed and negotiated on now. But I'm quite clear that the UK must not be Unilateral held decision to leave must be there. It, the UK must cannot be held against its will in a customs arrangement. And if the Prime Minister or Brussels or British negotiators say, look, there, have, there has to be some sort of joint decision making when it comes to leaving this this customs territory. You would say no, I will not support that. Just that's a yes or no, and it's clear, isn't it? Well, I don't think it is. So I'm sorry, I'm I'm not trying to be difficult, but I think what how I would put it is that the UK cannot be held in a customs arrangement. Mm. Now, how exactly that works is the point that's being negotiated now. So, but it I can't be a joint decision, Andrea, from your point of view, can it? It, well, it, it cannot be a decision that can be overturned by the European Union. It, it must be capable for the United Kingdom to decide to leave that customs arrangement and it cannot be something that the European Union can then hold us to. And frankly, it's, it's, it's because that would be to then fail to fulfil on the will of the people expressed at the referendum and I very much doubt that we would get it through Parliament. Yeah. Is there any possibility that the Prime Minister may say, look, this is the best we can get, let's go with it? You know, the the Prime Minister is absolutely flat out trying to finalise this final element of the negotiation. We're 95% there. There's a huge amount of work being done. This is definitely a sticking point and people are very much focused, including the Prime Minister herself, in actually resolving this. And I hope and expect that that resolution will come soon. There is also a suggestion, isn't there, of maybe you say that Europe, the EU can't have a, a block, a veto on Britain leaving this, this customs territory, this, uh, this customs arrangement. Some talk of a, maybe an independent mechanism to arbitrate this. Would that, would that meet the case? Well, again, it would very much depend on the terms. So all I can say is that the UK must not in a customs arrangement yep. backstop, should we get to it, which we don't expect to, cannot be held in that customs arrangement. Neither by the EU or by an independent mechanism. Indeed. Um, OK, that, yep. that's very clear. And if you were asked to support such an arrangement, your answer is... As, I, as I've said earlier, I am working towards getting a deal that does not in, require the UK to be stuck, trapped in a customs arrangement. That's what I'm working towards. And I'm sticking in the government to make sure that that's where we get to in the end. And that you know, I'm absolutely determined about that. I'm also very clear that I don't think something that trapped the UK in any arrangement against our will would be sellable to members of parliament. No, I mean, if... If Parliament said no to a deal that's presented to to Parliament, what then? Something would have to be done to break that deadlock. And some, like Joe Johnson, your former colleague, he's resigned from the government, he says it should be a referendum. Whatever. Well, you know, we've had a referendum um, only two and a bit years ago. It was very clear. Mm. There was an enormous turnout. Mm. There was a very uh, convincing majority to leave the EU. And it is not the government's policy Mm. to have a second referendum. That's your answer to Joe Johnson, Andrew. That's your answer to Joe Johnson. But what if there is a deadlock? What if Parliament says no? No, there will not be a second referendum. There will not be a second referendum. Then how would you break that deadlock? So there would be, I mean, obviously the government would then need to consider its position in terms of whether to go back to the EU. I mean, it entirely depends on the terms under which Parliament expressed its view. It entirely depends on that. So it's impossible to speculate on exactly what the next steps would be at that point. But let's just go back to first principles. The government is determined to get a good deal that works for the UK and for the EU. And we believe that we will get there. And anything else at this point is just speculation. Well, arguably necessary speculation if you're trying to figure out the direction of travel, because there is no deal at the moment. We don't know that there will be a deal. We don't know that Parliament will support it. If Parliament says no to whatever's presented, the country will want to know what then. A referendum, a general election, the, the options narrow down very quickly, don't they? Well, yeah, I I don't agree. We are focused on getting a good deal. That is the central piece of work that's going on. And that, we believe, will then uh, be accepted by Parliament. You know, why do do you believe that when you see so many in your your party set against what's being discussed on both sides of the Brexit divide? When you see the opposition where they are, it adds up to a government defeat. 
Uh, uh, well, I don't agree. Um, you know, I talk a great deal to colleagues right across the political divide and across the House. I believe that a majority, a clear majority of members of Parliament want to fulfil the will of the people as expressed in the referendum and that most members of Parliament would vote for a deal rather than no deal. So I just don't agree with your assertion mm. there. No, but uh, they but wouldn't, the many of them would not accept those. Are the, that, that's the choice, not between... To the, the plan or no plan. They would say, well, we could go back to the country with a referendum, or as Jeremy Corbyn would argue, we could go to go to a general election. Because going back to Brussels and saying, let's do it all over again, that's not going to be an option, is it? Well, you know, again, you're, you're speculating on possible outcomes and what the government is focused on is getting a deal that means that Parliament will want to support it. And, you know, that is the central piece of work that's being done now. And you know, I genuinely think most members of Parliament will act in the best interests of their country. So a second referendum or indeed a general election are not, in most people's view, in the best interests of our country. What you- is, is getting a good deal and leaving the EU on good terms with our EU friends and neighbours and then moving on so that we can write those free trade deals with the rest of the world so that the UK can become once again a real force for good in the world as an independent sovereign nation. Can you be, in a, in a nutshell, can you be at all confident there will be a deal? Of course, yes, yes. I, I'm extremely optimistic. Why? There's a huge amount of work going on at the moment to, to make sure that that is the case. Because nobody wants the UK to leave the EU with no deal. The, the EU27 don't want that. The Commission don't want that. The UK certainly doesn't want that. It would be devastating for the economy in the Republic of Ireland. It would be very damaging for our Polish friends and neighbours, for French farming and food producers, for German manufacturers. I don't believe anybody wants the UK to leave without a deal. So it does require compromise. And I'm absolutely certain that the EU27 will recognise that it's not it's not realistic or indeed honourable to expect the United Kingdom to accept a backstop that, re- that, that removes the power of the United Kingdom to take a sovereign decision on, on removing ourselves from that. Okay, I want to ask you about um, matters close to the House of Commons in, in a second, very briefly, just at the end. But just to, just to close this part of, the, of our conversation, you have no intention of leaving the government. You, you mean to stick with this through thick and thin? I mean to support the Prime Minister to get a Brexit that works for the United Kingdom and the EU, keeps our country together and delivers on the referendum. That's my absolute plan yeah. and what I'm spending a huge amount of time and energy on. Others might resign, though. Well, you know... For every individual, they do what they think is right. Are you expecting resignation I'm after not. Joe Johnson? No, I'm not. That was an, uh, that was a great um, surprise to me that he resigned. I do urge colleagues to support the Prime Minister. Genuinely, I think, you know, we're, we are at a very difficult stage. It was always going to be a difficult negotiation, but it is a negotiation. And therefore, what we have to do is to hold our nerve and keep negotiating, make sure that we're pointing out to our EU friends and neighbours that... It's in all of our interest to get a good deal and just get it over the line. And I think that that's where the government is focused. Do you, do you perceive any manoeuvring among your cabinet colleagues with an eye to a coming leadership contest? I could name you, I don't know, half a dozen cabinet members who probably have thoughts of maybe being our next leader. Well, you know, I'm just, I am supporting the Prime Minister and that is, I'm not seeing um, colleagues manoeuvring. I think within the Cabinet, um, all of the colleagues I speak to are totally supportive of the Prime Minister. So I think there's a lot of speculation, but it's unwarranted. Okay, last one then. There's been a scathing report at Westminster on what was was found to be a culture of bullying and cover-up of abuse in Parliament. The hierarchy at Westminster was found to have failed. Very straightforwardly, Can the Speaker, John Burko, in your view, credibly stay on and lead the way to a solution now? Well, for individuals, uh, and in particular the role of the Speaker, um, that is a matter for MPs. That is not a matter for me. I've been very... As an MP, then? Yeah, no, as Leader of the Commons, I am a member of the House Commission. In terms of the governance of the House itself and of the protection and management of House of Commons staff, who are the people that Laura Cox's report was uh, referring to, that needs to be much more um, hands-on 
and there needs to be much more responsibility taken for what's gone on culturally in mm. the past. So a complaints procedure is one thing. Going forward, I do believe that the work we've done will change the culture. But looking at the history of it and the confidence of staff that things will change, I think senior management in the House needs to be much more hands-on and committed and the House Commission itself needs to change. So... so reform not resignations well you know resignations are a matter for the individuals i think the cox report is very clear that she felt that those at the top of the management of the house commission should consider whether they can be a part of um creating that safe the speakers at the very top well the speaker the speaker's role in in my view is one that is not hands on it it, it oh. goes to the it goes to the very clear line between accountability and authority and i think the speaker has a lot of authority but the question is whether that role has the accountabilities Andrea Ledsom, the leader of the House of Commons, talking to me just ahead of the show. Sam Coates and Joe Tanner with me here listening to that. A couple of things came through repeatedly, really, time and time again. Andrea Ledsom does not want to leave the government, does not want to leave the Cabinet. But although she didn't put it quite this straightforwardly, there are red lines. And when it comes to, in the end, Britain's right to leave on its own decision without any veto from Europe or any kind of independent body, that's a red line. And she will not allow that to be crossed there. I think that's right. I mean, you've got to square what Andrea Leadsom's saying with the detail as we understand it that's being negotiated in Brussels. What they are continuing to look at are joint review mechanisms involving automatic or both parties having to refer situations to a committee and the possible involvement of the ECJ. When you listen to Andrea, it sounds simple. When you listen to the detail of the negotiation, it sounds a lot more complicated. Mm. So quite where she fits with what eventually ends up coming out. I'm clearly hoping uh, for some kind of constructive fudge from what I and, what I hear there. But in the end, Britain has a unilateral right to walk away from a, the customs territory, unilateral, on its own authority and decision, or it doesn't. You can have all the mechanisms and reviews that you like, but in the end it does come down to that, doesn't it? Well, it does, except that there then has to be a conversation about the consequences. And we are still absolutely unclear what happens if we completely walk away after Brexit Day while still trying to negotiate our future relationship, what happens to Northern Ireland? Mm. Because the suggestion seems to be, either explicitly in the withdrawal agreement or implicitly, that if we just give up on the talks, we walk away, we head back towards no deal after Brexit Day, then Northern Ireland, in order to stop that hard border returning and risk a return to the conflict of the past, so we would say the British government say, you would then have Northern Ireland tied to the single market Mm. and the customs union. I, I don't but the other thing that comes across very clearly, very quickly, on, from Andrea Ledsom is she is still the Brexiteer talking up and talking in favour of where Theresa May is heading. I just want to make the very obvious point that, that, that Andrea Ledsom hates where we are. Mm. Now, that's not me just saying that. Mm. I am looking at the Cabinet Minute from July, where she gave her unvarnished verdict in private, unfortunately it's for her, it's leaked, of what she thinks. And it begins, and I just can give you two sentences, mm. the leader of the House of Commons, Andrew Ledson, said she hated the proposal and regarded it as breaching the government's red lines and not being true to uh, the 17.2 million people uh, that voted for Brexit. The people had known what they were voting for and the government couldn't just congratulate itself uh, on knowing better yeah. than them. That's what she thinks in private. You've heard how she does it in public. Yeah. It's a big disconnect. And that, 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 that sort of it is why we're watching Andrea Leadsom, among others in the Cabinet, like Completely. a hawk. Who is going to finally kick up? Who is going to walk out if the deal is un, unpalatable to them? Let's now talk to Nia Griffiths, the Labour Shadow Defence Secretary. Morning to you, Good morning. Nia. Thanks for, uh, for coming in. Let me ask you this. Listen, talking to Andrea Leadsom there, she kept saying, didn't she, that she thinks there's a majority, most MPs in the House of Commons, believe in delivering the will of the, of the British people. Now, she clearly hopes there'll be a number or enough on your side of Labour MPs who may vote with the government on a deal, if there is a deal, to see it over the line. But the Labour Party, the line is going to be, at least the official line, vote against a deal, isn't it? Well, well, absolutely. What we absolutely support is the fact that the vote to, two years ago showed that the people of the UK voted in favour of leaving. Um, and that's why we voted to trigger Article 50. But what they did not vote for was to see their job prospects and the economy worsen. And so we are very clear that we cannot possibly support a bad 
deal. Neither can we support some sort of blind deal with vague promises down the line when we've seen two and a half years mm. of failure by this government to negotiate anything at all. And when you say we, though, there's a problem with that, isn't there? Because some of your your colleagues, some of your respected colleagues have said they may be ready to vote with the government, even if it means defying the official Labour line, for fear of tipping the country into a place where there is no deal. We walk away with no deal at all. That might just help the government over the line if, when it comes to that. Um, I, I quite, quite frankly, when people see what is on, on the table, that will be the time when we can discuss this in detail. But it's being discussed but, now, but, Nia, but isn't it? But my, uh, my feeling very much amongst my colleagues mm. is that we really cannot support a bad deal. Um, we certainly don't want to see no deal. So we feel very much that the option has to be that we have uh, a general election to put a mm. better negotiating Some of your in. colleagues near people like, look, just at random, Lisa Nandy, the MP in Wigan, a respected figure on the back benches. He doesn't generally fall out um, with the leader if she can, as far as I can see, avoid it. She's saying she may vote, vote with the government on this, and there are others like that. The number varies depending on who you who you well, guess what, it with, but it may be enough. It may be enough. Well, well, what she's saying very clearly is that she respects the vote, particularly in her constituency, which is yeah. a leave vote, Yes, and that she respects the fact that people do want to see some sort of um, workable deal, but I cannot see Lisa supporting something which is going to decimate the jobs in the economy because mm. we're, we're quite clear that we understand that you know many many of our leave voters in in our predominantly leave constituencies uh, are very much in favor of a continued uh, form of what they would term common market mm. in old speak can you they see... want a good customs union deal and they want a good deal with access to the single market. What they do not want to see is, um, is quite frankly, a complete muddle, which is what we're getting at the moment from Theresa We May. could end up with a complete deadlock, couldn't we? An absolute deadlock with a deal coming to the House of Commons, which is then rejected. And then maybe you tell me what you think. A referendum, a fresh referendum, you could argue that may be the only way to break that deadlock. Can you imagine your leader, who is now clearly not in favour, Jeremy Corbyn, in favour of a referendum? Can you imagine him shifting ground on that? Well, what we have said very clearly and Keir Starmer set out in the newspaper today is that in the event of uh, a hopelessly bad deal on the table, in the event of no uh, possibility of a general election, then we are prepared to work cross-party to mm. try to put together mm. something uh, which would protect jobs in the economy, which would was give us... But give us, what give do you mean us, by uh, something? Was, well, I a, was asking a, about a referendum. We're, well, we're, we're talking about the potential of a, a, a deal which mm. would um, keep us within a customs union, which give us access to the single market in the best possible way. And we've said that we would be prepared to sit down mm. and look at a way forward on that. But the problem we've got at the moment is that we have a Conservative Party yeah. which is deeply divided. Yeah. We have... Um, sort of extreme Brexiteers jumping off on one side. Clearly the Remainers are finding it now an intolerable position, as mm. Joe Johnson has just uh, uh, expressed this weekend. Um, and we're not seeing from Theresa May anything on the table which um, is likely to be supported across yeah. the House of Commons. OK, but your party conference this autumn, mm. it kept left open the option of a possible referendum as a way through uh, ultimately. Yesterday, Jeremy Corbyn, the leader of your party, was saying no referendum. The people have spoken. How do you square that? Uh, what Jeremy was saying was that we accept that people voted leave in 2016 and we accept... He said there'd been a referendum, suggested that's it, no more. We've, we've, no we've more had of those. a referendum in 2016 and, that we, and we accept that people voted leave. Uh, but what we have obviously got to look at now is the reality of what is actually being put in front of us by, uh, by Theresa May. Uh, what sort of uh, deal and Brexit deal is she putting on the table? And we have said that in the uh, event of an uh, intolerable deal or, or a no deal situation, that we are keeping all options open. We're keeping all options on the table. And that was what that long discussion at conference was all about. Mm. Um, and that you know we would like to, we would like to have a meaningful participation by Parliament because we believe in parliamentary democracy. We believe in uh, making sure that we try as responsibly as we possibly can to to get something which works, and that's why we're talking about working cross party on that. Um, and as I say, we would far rather have a uh, a better team in our own team in doing that negotiation, trying to get something sensible. Uh, but uh, you know, we ha we're not taking any option off the table. It's Remembrance Sunday. What what would you be thinking, Nia, when the silence falls? 
But I think there are two very important things. First of all, that we remember the immense sacrifice, not just in the First World War, but in all the conflicts since, of our brave, brave armed forces, men and women. But I think secondly, particularly on the centenary of that armistice, it's about the importance of going forward and thinking, how do we avoid conflict in the future? thinking about the setting up of the League of Nations and then the United Nations after the Second World War and the importance of using international organisations, no matter how imperfect, uh, to have dialogue between nations, to use diplomacy and, wherever possible, to avoid conflict and slaughter. Okay, just, just last one, on your own uh, brief of defence, which obviously includes the, the independent nuclear deterrent, John McDonnell, the Shadow Chancellor, and very, very close to Jeremy Corbyn. Some people say not always very close, but he's pretty close to Jeremy Corbyn. He said during the, the Labour Party conference on the independent deterrent that the Prime Minister, if it were to be Jeremy Corbyn, would decide on the possible use of of that deterrent on the basis of advice from ministers, from the community too. What, what does that mean? Well, I think it, it, what, what John is saying very clearly is that you know, Jeremy takes the security of the country very, very seriously. He said very clearly that he would do what it takes. And yes, he would have a, a measured consideration in, in all circumstances about any use of a, a nuclear deterrent. And what we are very clear about is that what we should have um, is a much, much bolder stance by the UK on the world stage to be ensuring that we don't get to that stage mm. and that we are working on diplomatic initiatives, that we are working on a rules-based system and that we as the UK are first and foremost in upholding that. Mm. I mean, it, to the extent that that was clear, he's very clear that he would never order the use of the deterrent, isn't he? Well, as, as John has said, um, he would take into consideration <coughs> all the advice that he's given and he's been very clear about putting the defence of this nation first. Neil Griffiths, good to talk to you. Thank you very much indeed for coming in. Neil Griffiths, Shadow Defence Secretary for the Labour Party. With me here in the studio still, Sam Coates and Joe Tanner and now Johnny Mercer, the Conservative MP for Plymouth Moor View. Good morning, Johnny. Good morning. And thanks for, for coming in. Johnny... You, of course, served in the army for a number of years. You saw action in Afghanistan over a number of tours. You lost colleagues, comrades and close friends in an action in Afghanistan. Just, just if you can, look ahead to what you will be thinking during the silence. Um, well, I think uh, clearly we uh, remember our contemporary colleagues and, and those who sort of last moments we saw and... Uh, and uh, um, their sort of supreme sacrifice, but it was always uh, measured against the extraordinary endeavours of the generations before us. Um, and, uh, you know, it makes you think, uh, yes, of their loss, but very proud as well, you know, that uh, people believe in the cause and the nation so much to uh, uh, to be willing to make those sacrifices to, uh, you know, to stand up for what we believe in and what, what unites us as a country. I know we're extraordinarily divided at the moment, um, but I think, uh, you know, there's millions of ordinary men and women up and down this country who have sacrificed so, so much over the last 100 years. You know, we will we will be OK in the end. And, uh, you know, and, and that's quite heartwarming in divided times. Yeah. And your, your prime motivation when you came into politics, almost to your own surprise, uh, coming into to, to politics, it was it was a lot to do with the care of veterans. You explain this in your book, which I recommend. Does the government now care about veterans i think um i think uh, ministers and, and mps have always have always cared um the trouble is actually matching that with with doing something effective um you know it's hard not to care about veterans it's a very emotive cause um but it requires more than that to actually deliver something for your average veteran in this country today to make them feel like they are being looked after by a country for whom they have sacrificed um, sometimes the best years of their life. Um, so, look, I think we've made improvements. Of course, I do. Have we gone fast enough? Um, nowhere near fast enough. Are we ambitious enough? Nowhere near. Um, you know, we're still the only Five Eyes country who doesn't have a Department for Veterans Affairs or a Veterans Commission or someone who pulls together all functions of government um, to look 
after these people. And, you know, it does remain, you know, three years on from my speech where I, I called it a stain on, on this country, I'm afraid. You know, to, to some extent, it still remains. We've got people like Tobias Elwood and Mark Lancaster, who's in the role before, who, who are pushing really hard. But ultimately, this is, uh, you know, this is, this is bigger than one department. Mm. Um, and uh, it's time for a refresh, in my mm. view. And you've been pushing on that front for a, a good long, long time. And you caused there a stir... Um, a couple of weeks ago, more than just a stir, when you described the state of politics really quite bluntly, although people get a bit sensitive, oversensitive sometimes about plain language, without mm. you know, without sort of stirring that one up again, inviting more uh, superfluous tweets and, 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 and protests, is the situation of politics now, from the mess you argue that it's in, a lot of people might agree with that, is it retrievable? Yeah, I think it is retrievable, because politicians ultimately are servants of the people, and the people and the character of this country doesn't change. Um, ultimately, we will get through this period. Um, you know, my views on, on where we are and how we've got here and, you know, how we're handling it are, are widely known. Um, but I, you know, I, I have confidence in, in the country, but more the people of this mm. country who will ultimately um, not put up with uh, being governed in uh, in the manner that they currently are. Um, I think, you know, it's clear to me... That well, you actually we, argued, Johnny, you, you said that if given a choice now, you probably wouldn't be a member of parliament. You probably wouldn't even vote for the Tory party or any other any other party. But there you are now in, in politics and, and still active. Has it ever, for a moment, Johnny, occurred to you that you might be the one to retrieve it? <laughs> no, not at this stage. I think uh, there's people who've been here sort of far longer than me. Although I would say that... Uh, you know, the the more it sort of falls apart, I'm afraid individuals like like me and uh, and colleagues like me are not sort of here for the ride. We we're here because we believe in something, and we're going to fight as hard for what we believe this country is about mm. um, as much as those who sort of dominate the airwaves on the left and the right of the argument at the moment. Um, you know, I have a very clear view of a, of a modern Britain and um, the people who live in this country. I fought for this country, and of course, I'll fight for it again. Yeah, look, let me ask you this then. Look, you you. You've got a particular perspective on leadership and what it what it means. When you look at your leader now, your commanding officer, Theresa May, in your judgment, is she made of the right stuff when it comes to leadership? Look, I don't I don't really want to say anything about um, the prime minister in that regard. She is uh, clearly grappling with a very difficult situation. She came into a very difficult situation. Has she entirely helped herself? Uh, no. Has she surrounded herself with the most capable people and the most capable cabinet to solve the massive challenges this country faces mm. um the answer is no but um you know she is she is dealing with extraordinarily difficult times she has a a very difficult job to do you know i'm not going to comment on on her sort of personal qualities you know for, for people like me it's about it's about uh, leadership it's about finding a way through this very divided time um and coming together and actually meeting the challenge you know for, for a lot of people in this country today life is extremely difficult um and government has to do better to meet those challenges yeah. when you look at the the cabinet now surrounding theresa may is there anyone you can see there who you believe you might be able to follow with any enthusiasm i mean we all know the names that that leap to mind i could give you quite a long list jeremy hunt michael go sarjid javid dominic Raab. i could name other people too who you sort of suspect quite fancy themselves in the in the top job matt hancock and maybe maybe one or two other who nurse the dream almost despite themselves can you see anyone there that you could follow with any any enthusiasm. Um, look, there's some there's some great individuals in there. I, I do think we slightly look at this uh, this question the wrong way. It's not you know some one individual is not going to meet all the challenges we currently face, and we need to as a Conservative Party need mm. to have a look at what we offer as a group of individuals. You know, we're always going to be able to achieve extraordinary things if we work together as a team. So, what is the next group of individuals going to offer to this country as a modern Conservative Party? And the answer for me lies in that. You know, you can chase around the edges of individuals in this game and they will all have their faults and all have their uh, their mm. plus points but ultimately we have to present a team of individuals with a, a, an ethos and a set of values that is going to go and get people out to vote for us so that we can make sure a modern uh, a modern conservative party meets the challenges of a modern britain uh, johnny your uh, critique has fired up a lot of people it has inspired some people it has dismayed others um and it articulates very clearly some of the frustrations that people feel about this conservative party but while the criticisms are very clear i feel like your solutions are almost entirely absent what what you seem to be giving 
again and again and again is a council of despair. You don't have a name of an alternative. You don't have a sort of plan to fulfil. You, all you're doing is criticising. Or any of us can do that. The media doesn't. Mm. Your backbench colleagues do it. But what yeah. is it that you can bring to the party that says this is where we should go? Because at the moment, that that's not what anybody's hearing. It's yeah. just a it's a list of problems, not not any sense of solution. No, look, I accept that. I've I've got to be honest. I think uh, I think it's slightly unfair because I do talk about uh, a modern conservative party all the time. I've mentioned it six or seven times this morning. But, but I talk modern about cons- things like no about things like universal credit, solution. things like universal credit, and getting policies like that right. Things like uh, modernising the NHS. You you know you talk to most people in this country for whom government is huge they'll talk about healthcare, meeting those challenges in a way, you know, governing every single policy with a, an ethos and set of values that makes people want to go out and vote for a modern Britain. The trouble is, you know, criticisms, I'm afraid, of course, garner the attention. Yeah. Um, and th- and that's what's happened. And, you know, I, I absolutely accept the charge and I will work harder to lay out that vision. I think uh, m- many of us has been, but I'm afraid it, it doesn't get the attention. That's down to us to work harder to make sure it does. Johnny Mercer, good to talk to you. This morning, we've just got a couple of minutes at the end of the show to catch up on the, another story, which is getting our attention, sometimes almost despite ourselves. It's the, 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 the United States after the midterm elections and the way the president, Donald Trump, has been handling himself and the direction that he's taking. And Ron Christie's uh, come up on the line. He's a Republican political strategist, a former advisor to President George W. Bush. Good morning to you. Mr. Christie. Good morning. Just can I ask you this because it's got some attention at the moment. What do you make of the news that the president cancelled his armistice cemetery visit due to bad weather? That's caused some adverse comment. What do you think? Well, it's a little confusing to be perfectly honest with you. The United States Secret Service is in charge of protecting the life and the safety of the president of the United States, and certainly a decision had to have been made by someone that it was unsafe for Marine One, the president's helicopter, to travel uh, to the ceremonies. Now, my question is, where were the backup plans? Where was the contingency Mm. in case of bad weather? I mean, there's been some comment, I don't know how much, um, you know, with with tongue-in-cheek, that it might have had something to do with the president being concerned about the effects of rain on his hair. Do you give that any credence? (laughs) No, I I don't. Look, there are a lot of things that that President Trump... uh, certainly takes to his appearance, but I don't think rain uh, getting on the top of his head was at the top of his concern. Okay. He has been willing, hasn't he, since those results? He called them a a, a huge victory. Others say there's been a setback. He's he's had a a fight with the US media. In a word, was that wise or was that part of the plan? I think that's part of his plan. If you look at our midterm elections here in the United States, Everyone from either side of the political spectrum got something of what they wanted. The Democrats who've been out of power for eight years got control of the House. Republicans expanded their majority in the Senate by at least three seats. But I find it somewhat chaotic that the president continues his war on the American press corps. It does seem to be part of his modus operandi. And from his point of view, arguably, he thinks it's working for him. I'd love to talk for longer. So that's PNR's politics then for another week. Joe and, and Sam still with me. Joe, what's stuck in your mind from that? Firstly, I'd have loved to have known the answer to the question about whether Andrea Leadsom wished she'd got the job now (laughs) and actually had been Prime Minister trying to sort this all out because you do wonder what difference it would have... It had someone else taken that job where we might have been. Mm. One of many questions I didn't ask. But, I mean, I'm not for... for not for a minute suggesting Andrew would have necessarily done a better yeah. or worse job, but the idea of do, just part of you think I'm so glad it's not me in that room mm. making those decisions or trying to make those decisions. But also, you know, listening to Johnny Mercer talk, you know, a, a man who served his country very well and, you know, then has gone out on a limb to call out what's really going on in Westminster and how he sees the government and actually a political elite, I suppose you would call them, are, are behaving at the moment and probably speaks for a lot of people who fairly despairing of it all mm, so. I thought the uh, I was pushing Johnny on okay there's your critique but what's your answer it's, it's a tough question but and, and and Johnny has something approaching an answer to that but but he's not alone that is the problem across politics there is nobody Theresa May's leadership style is not to lead not to give too much of a sense of a purpose or plan. Bluntly, when it comes to the biggest questions facing this country today, I think that could also that charge could also be levelled on things like Brexit to, to, to Jeremy Corbyn uh, as well. And I think that uh, his struggle to articulate exactly what better looks like, 
I think would be the case for an awful lot of people mm. in politics at the moment. As not, people... not just better, but almost anything. I mean, it's, it's, it's the nature of this conundrum that there simply is not a clear answer. One does not exist. I'll, I'll let you into a personal secret. The, the journalist in me, at the moment, given everything that's going on, couldn't couldn't be happier. The <laughs> citizen in me couldn't he's be more... revelling in our misery, basically, of not knowing what's going to go on. That's <laughs> that's probably, saying that but at not. the same time, the citizen in me covering and seeing extremely close up what 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 I see as I'm sure you do Joe, Joe and uh, and you John couldn't be more depressed i mean the uh lack of willing for people to engage to understand to explain to plan to put up their own narrative to put up a counter narrative to argue and to articulate the reason that joe johnson i suspect has just moved the dial a little bit in terms of where we are on brexit is because he went out there and articulated a case there's a lot of other people could have done, but somebody needed to do, mm. and he has now. And that is just the feeling of somebody explaining what's going on isn't happening enough in British politics. And I think that's what I want every politician today, as we think about the past and the future, to think about. Can you explain properly to yourself where you are and where you want this country to go? And if you can't, mm. what are you doing? No. And here's another impossible question. This time next week, when we're sitting in this studio... What would have happened? What was the story? Nothing. Two weeks ago, two weeks ago, the papers were full of Armageddon. And there was going to be a coup, a palace coup against Theresa May. The place was going to, you know, metaphorically explode. Of course, it didn't. It didn't remotely happen. Now we've got a crunch cabinet meeting on Tuesday, heads getting together, plotting and all the rest of it. I think you're right, probably. When is Which probably means it will happen, by the way, but this time next Sunday, we will not have had the crunch. But when is when is a cabinet meeting not a crunch cabinet meeting at mm. the moment? I mean, mm. you know, Sam's absolutely right about Joe Johnson. Someone once said about, you know, the quiet man turning up the volume and it didn't really shake anything. But the difference with Joe Johnson, it's when the ones you don't expect that do something is when things start to change. And the interesting thing is what happens next. In a way, I'm not sure it's the cabinet that are that significant. I think it is the other quiet folk that you don't expect to do something that start to do things that then make you realise because collective responsibility they might all mm. wimp out and finally decide they've all got to go in one direction yeah. and so more joe johnson's you reckon sam do you reckon more joe johnson's this maybe this week <sighs> maybe uh, uh, and i'm not sure there are mil- many brilliant things about penal's politics but one of the things about it is it's recorded on a sunday And that means that you spend a lot of time responding to the Sunday newspapers. Now, I'm going to stand up here for the Monday to Saturday newspapers, (laughs) which the Times is one. Sunday newspapers like to make the world look binary, exciting, to justify six days' worth of work. I'm afraid the reality is much more boring. It is grinding, it is uncertain, uh, and it involves competing priorities. And uh, I wish I knew every aspect of what was going. So do I think that there might be a deal this week? Maybe. Maybe not. Do I think there might be some people resigning this week? Maybe, maybe not. I don't know, and I'm proud to say that because I'm a Monday to Saturday yeah. journalist, and that's what we do. That's, a, that's, a, that's an absolutely fair point to be made by a daily, a daily. It's actually the rest journalist. of us. We all know. Don't Although one who also on. contributes to the to the online times, which is which is a moment by moment experience as he's as he's broadcasting. So basically, don't believe anything we just said because it could all change tomorrow. <laughs> 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 but you can utterly believe that we mean it when we say it. And that's that's the best that we can do. That's it for uh, for this week. We'll be, we, we will, I think, be back next week. The world cannot change so much that we're not back this week, surely, although I'm tempted. Maybe, late. maybe we not. We might be on election footing, who knows? Let's say see you then. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts.